This week on Intrigued Full Effect. So we know trauma can rewire the brain, but the right treatment and the right uh, support and the right relationship, we can rewire the brain for healing as well. And I think that we don't really talk about that uh, uh, enough. I'm Shandrea Thomas, and welcome to episode 55. In this podcast, I talk about curious cases, disappearances, and other stuff. And today we're having a deep conversation that covers a lot. We're talking about trauma. So that's why I invited Dr. Damond Holt, who is a trauma expert and a pastor, along with Theta Wilson, who is a trauma survivor and an advocate for families with missing loved ones. Now, this is a conversation that might help you in more ways than you realize. We talked about ambiguous loss, grief, and a lot of other issues affecting our community. This is what happened. I am here with trauma expert Dr. Demond Holt and Theta Wilson, uh, who is someone I've known from my time working in St. Louis as a journalist. Today, we're doing something different. We're talking about trauma and the impact of trauma of people, you know, who live in violent cities, who've experienced uh, trauma, who's been victims of crime, and all of those things, missing and murdered people and their families, all of that. We want to get into some really deep conversations about the impact of all of that. And I think the two of you are the perfect people to have this really good conversation with. So thank you both for being here. I appreciate that. We have them. Absolutely. Now, Dr. Ho, let me ask you this really quickly, just to get it clarified. How do you define trauma? Uh, that's a really good question. Um, seeing that uh, trauma is like the buzzword, everybody talking about trauma, PTSD, things of that nature. But a lot of times people don't even know what that is. Um, and so from a doctor's perspective, according to uh, the American Psychological Association, uh, they define trauma to be a wound or an emotional injury to the brain that is physical, emotional, or sexual. Um, as a traumatologist and trauma doctor, I like to put an extra little sauce on it and make it more lay, lay people's uh, language, is that pretty much uh, it's a wound or injury when life devastating and life threatening things has happened to you. So it uh, And it doesn't just impact the brain, sometimes trauma actually re rewires the brain. So people are not exactly the same prior to that incident that happened. So that's how we look at it. It's a it's an injury and wound to the brain when uh, traumatic experiences has happened to that, that person. Mm -hmm. Now, what is it about trauma that made you go into that specialty? I'm just curious. <laughs> I hear a lot of people ask that. Uh, I felt like it was called, I felt like I was called to it. Uh, I don't think I chose it. I think um, I was, I gravitated towards it because I thought that, uh, number one, uh, the way we're trained in alternative medicine is to look, and functional medicine is to investigate root causes to disease. And so I began to look at trauma as being many of the root causes uh, to many of our chronic diseases in our body and also mood disorders and psychiatric disorders in the brain. You know, you weren't born depressed, so something had to happen to your life to bring depression. And there is a there is a huge alignment of traumatic experience, especially early childhood uh, traumas. That while we have so many adults today uh, that are struggling with uh, mental illness uh, like depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, and even substance abuse as well, you know that opens the door. Trauma opens the door for substance abuse too. So people are using drugs and alcohol uh, to cope with their pain and trauma that they never dealt with. So now you got two issues. You still got the same original issue of trauma you never identified, and now you have an addiction problem. So although that is one of the big reasons why I went into the area to really look at root causes by, by which many people are not well uh, mentally, emotionally, and physically. You know, and I've always wondered too, like if if trauma is something, you know, when I think about slavery and all of that stuff, if it's like in your DNA almost, you know what I'm saying? Oh, most definitely. Um, as a traumatologist, I, I have tra trainings and research on all kinds of things um, in regards to trauma. So I teach on acute trauma, chronic trauma, complex trauma, generational trauma, uh, historical trauma, relational trauma, vicarious trauma, there's all kinds of ways you can go at it. Uh, but most definitely... And uh, in my research and in some of the trainings I do uh, for different agencies, most definitely uh, there's something called race-based trauma. We call it racial trauma. Uh, me and a colleague right now is writing a book called Black Trauma. And so I actually speak about the science of epigenetics, which is many of our experiences do impact the way our genes are expressed in our DNA. And so uh, when that happens, 
uh, we pass those along. So a lot of times what great, great grandmama endured, she passed it on to grandmama. And because in our community, especially black communities, we don't go to doctors, we don't like seeing therapists, we pass it on to the mother and then the mother passes it on to the daughter, daughter passes it on to the grandchild. So this is the reason why sometimes we're in that vicious cycle in certain communities in regards to our traumas because, you know, we don't identify it. And then sometimes just a lack of knowledge. We just didn't understand that uh, when my great granddaddy went through, no wonder, you know, his son got anger issues and he got domestic violence cases. So so it can really go deep, but uh, most definitely it impacts the way our genes are expressed which is trauma also doesn't impact the brain, but trauma also impacts the body. And this is the reason why we see more metabolic diseases and chronic diseases and autoimmune disease in, in individuals as well um, because of a lot of trauma stress that our brain doesn't turn off. So we see it in our GI. We see more people with a lot of trauma stress, have a lot of stomach issues, immunity issues, um, can't really rebound from disease um, because of all of that stress. And then my concern is if we don't turn the trauma off and it's impacting the body, then we have something called uh, chronic and cellular inflammation, which is a whole nother conversation, which creates more medical conditions and disease. Mm -hmm. Now, Theta, I know you've been through uh, your sense of, tra you know, trauma and uh, not only with that, but you also help other people going through their own trauma. So you're not only are you managing your own situation, but you're also absorbing other people's stuff too. So how, how are you managing that? And how has your trauma kind of manifested itself in your life since your son disappeared? Well, I guess I start just by thanking um, doc, the doctor, Dr. Hope, for even mentioning all the things and reminding me of the miracle that I am. Because as a child growing up in the hood, of course, I've experienced a lot of trauma, you yeah. know, things that, that occurred that, you know, some people around me, even within my family, they may never speak of, but I remember. And that's one reason why I'm trying to uh, therapeutically just write about those things, put those into a book to hopefully encourage other people so that they will be inspired to live in spite of their circumstances. So um, me having a missing child and then serving other people with missing loved ones, knowing that they may be found deceased you know, a lot of times missing person cases or just murder cases waiting to be solved. So it's like I had to already prepare myself, which I, I feel like life just growing up in the hood just prepared me because there were a lot of things that I had to learn how to do to adjust, code switching. Look at, I mean, I look like a little boy growing up. So sometimes I put that little swag walk on just to avoid certain circumstances because I was afraid that if they knew I was a female that I may be raped or something like that. So just growing up in those kind of environments and then eventually um, being a, a product of the St. Louis public school system, um, learning, you know, what I needed to in order to educate the people that I served because I, wor I worked as a teacher. So I was able to identify things that I remember I went through. I was able to see it in my children. I was able to say, um, baby, did you eat today? You know, people didn't ask me if I ate, but I knew and I had learned that if I didn't eat, I may have a uh, hypoglycemic uh, episodes or, or feel like my blood sugar is low. And then I knew that in my readings that a lot of people who committed certain kind of crimes, their blood sugar levels were low. You know, and so I'm just thinking about all the things that I could do within my life um, just by eating right, sleeping right, thinking right, just being right, putting myself in the right environments, just trying to manage everything that I could do. You know, I found myself doing those things and trying to teach people how to do the same thing through my efforts of saving people by increasing awareness and, um, you know, helping families navigate the missing person process through looking for an angel. Mm -hmm. And like, and I'm wondering too, like, how have you been able to, because your situation went on for years and years and years, and you still don't have the full answers as exactly. to where your, where your son is to this day. So I just wonder, exactly. how do you, how do you manage that? Like, how do you mentally deal with it? And do, do you go to therapy for that? Like, how, how are you dealing with that? Well, I remember when um, therapy was offered to me and a lot of times I was like, um, you know, just being a victim of crime and the type of crime that was committed, you know. You know, first of all, there are some agencies that won't even really address or provide services like um, I think it's crime victims compensation. I know that 
when I'm trying to help some families here in Missouri, the governor has this, um, I think he's the one that created the, the law or has something to do with the law being created. But if you have, if you're a victim of crime, there are services that are available to you that are not available to those with missing loved ones. And being a missing person or having a missing person in your family, you are impacted by crime. So I'm like, why are the, those services available if your son is deceased or your child, your loved one is found deceased? But in this ambiguous state that we find ourselves in, why isn't there like um, some psychological services or counseling service, behavior, behavioral services available to people like us? You know, I happen to get them because I knew how to get those. But a lot of times police officers or different agencies, they're not aware of these services being out there. And it, I think that they just look at missing person situations differently because of the fact that we're dealing with ambiguous grief or we can't put our fingers, finger exactly on it because we don't have a body to bury. We don't know where they are. We don't know if they're dead. We don't know if they're alive. But still, I feel like counseling is... It's a big part. It's something that needs to be done. And of, of course, a lot of black people don't like doing it. I mean, I personally didn't even want to do it going through the trial process or, or trying to um, get justice for my son because my situation started as a domestic situation. So we were in civil courts. The father was basically trying to strip me of my children wrongfully. I was never proven unsuitable, unfit or unable because I am suitable. I'm fit and I'm able. But yet and still, there was a system that was on his side, even though he's in jail for life now. But and even though he killed my son, but you know, before all of that had transpired, they gave my child over to him, knowing that it was not what was in the best interest of my children. I even had to deal with the grief with that. You know, nobody was interested in they they claimed to be interested in reunifying my family. But they did nothing to reunify my family because they told me there's nothing for me to do because they knew I hadn't done anything. Mm -hmm. So that led to other issues. And, and just think, to me, it's just like a miracle that I didn't become what I hate, you know, or, or that I didn't commit a crime or do something horrible. If it wasn't for the fact that I believed in that I believe in God, I would be a mess because I'm a great thinker. And I could think of things that nobody would want me to even think of. They probably wouldn't even think that I thought those kind of things. But in dealing with the things that I deal with, I have to think like the criminals. I have to think of where things could be, where my baby's body could be. I, I don't want to think about these things. But in order to solve the crime, sometimes you have to. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm willing to allow my brain to go places. But at the same time, I can't allow my brain to stay in those places because then I'll become what I hate. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's just really, you know, it's, it's, it's a miracle because I know that I'm doing some things that cops won't even do. And some cops need psychological services. They have psychological services available for them, but they don't even have them all for missing, for those with missing loved ones. And then there's a stigma attached with getting those services, which is really what I was trying to get to, because when they stripped me of my children, they made me take, I guess, a DSM-5. Or whatever, yeah. because the judge thought that there was something wrong with me psychologically. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Um, a psychological assessment. Exactly, and but the thing was, the lady wound up saying, "Well, she could be an engineer. She's extremely intelligent, but we think she's faking good." So you know, but but I already know that there's a there was a lot of biases in my situation because of the political influence that the fathers father the fathers people had and things like that. So I was able to I had to prepare my mind for a straight up battle mm -hmm. because the system was not willing to say what it is. So but because God had already prepared me, I was I was I was able to duck and move and jab and do what I had to do mm -hmm. emotionally and physically to navigate this process. But a lot of people are not able to do that. And then we're producing more problems in the community because now we have people who are victims of crime, who have missing loved ones, who have murdered loved ones if they get a resolution and then they're ready to take those issues into their own hands and become those victims that we find behind bars because the system has failed them. And so it's know, like we know what to do, but we're not allowing families to get get the, the, the services that they need or either we're labeling them because they got the services that they needed 
And then we're using that as a reason to keep them from having their children. Wow. So, you, you know, know? Dr. yeah. And actually, let, let me go to, to Dr. Holt about that, because, you know, culturally speaking, how she was saying, like, there's a stigma and all of that. How much difficulty have you seen in your time as far as getting people of color to come in, you know, to get those types of services? Has it been a challenge that you've seen over time? Oh, most definitely, especially in the communities of color. It's, really, it's a big challenge, especially African-Americans in particular. Um, which culturally, you know, sometimes when it comes to mental health and wellness, uh, we, we come with early childhood traumas. Um, we come, like, as, as Theta said, you know, come from the hood. I came from the hood. I'm not just a trauma expert. I'm a trauma survivor being born and raised out of Flint, Michigan, on the hood on the north side. So most of all my friends are dead or in prison. And my trajectory was the same. You know, if I didn't have a church, uh, if I didn't have the Urban League giving me my first job, so I wouldn't have to sell dope. Uh, if I had educators that wouldn't let me drop out of school and make sure I went to college and became very successful. So those things are very, very important. And uh, another thing, too, is a lot of our childhood traumas come with uh, secrets and the family. A lot of times things happen to us. We're not we're not allowed to talk about it. We are not allowed to expose the perpetrator. And sometimes stranger danger is not the one we should be watching. It should be those caregivers and those family members who are inappropriate touching, molesting, and all of those different things um, in the Black family. And so we create these barriers, these walls uh, to try to, we think, protect, but we really imprisoning people. Um, and so when they get older, we, we wonder how do so many um, adults have so many uh, mental illness and psychiatric disorders and mood disorders? It's because a lot of that stuff that happened that messed with our brains, that injured our brains, we never properly identified it. We never properly treated it. And then another thing, too, is we bring victims around perpetrators because we don't allow them to point the, point the finger at who did it and, and all of that. All of that plays a major part in the African-American thing. Two, I would talk about is uh, we, it's not enough of us, which means that there's not enough doctors of color, uh, especially even on the psychological side. It's only We only represent 4% in the nation. So that means most African-Americans and people of color who goes to see a doctor is going to get someone who lives in a different zip code, don't know nothing about the hood, don't know nothing about hypervigilance. I'm hearing bullets passing by you, gunshots, seeing a homie get blasted, uh, all of that or gang violence, they're, they're far removed. And, and and this is also an education issue too, because that's the some of our teachers that come into these spaces trying to teach black and brown kids, and they have no idea of what a kid is going through. A kid is not paying attention to algebra when they stumbling is growling. You know, so we have to really understand what this really means. And this also a plug, because my book is out on that called uh, Trauma is the New Public Health Emergency in Education. So we have a lot of educators using my book as a book study uh, throughout the nation, looking at all of the different traumas of how it has drastically impacted the, uh, the educational system. So yeah, so going back to that is, it's very, very important that uh, we have a space where people can uh, go and see their doctor and remove the stigma. You don't, you, you don't feel like, you don't feel some kind of way to have a dentist work on your teeth. You don't have a cardiologist. You don't feel some kind of way for a cardiologist to work on your heart. So why do we have uh, such a stigma for doctors to work on our minds? So we got to do better and get the word out. Mental health doesn't mean uh, psychotic. Mental health doesn't always mean straight jackets and all of the extreme therapies that takes place. Mental health is, is the same is the same as type 2 diabetes. Uh, it's just this is our mind. It's our brain. And if we don't feel some kind of way to take metformin to reduce our glucose levels um, with diabetes, then we should not feel some kind of way to see our, our, our psych docs and our psychologists and counselors as well. Yeah. And, and, and I think um, I think that's the other part of it, too. Like like you both were saying, there's this whole stigma. Culturally, there's a stigma. Pray it away. Go to church. Talk to your pastor. Yeah. Yeah. And all that. And that, that could be part of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. But yeah. the, it's not the full picture of what people need to get done. Right. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm just, OK, I'm trying to give the floor back to you. But I, I was just thinking about that, because a lot of times, especially when you're talking about trauma that happens in families, uh, I, I can understand the parent, you know, just wondering, what do I do if 
I expose the fact that my guy or my husband is doing something inappropriate yeah. to yeah. my child or a child that I know. You know, I know that that's hard to deal with. But uh, and and that's 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 his close to home too because of what the perpetrator did to his own children or the yeah. children that were in his care, you yeah. know. So it's like these kids are messed up for life. They don't know what family means anymore because they were in a place that they thought was a family, and then they found out that they were violated or what or their yeah. idea. They didn't even have an idea until they went through what they went through and some of those people think that's normal like it's some kind of rite of passage that it's okay for an adult to touch you at a certain age you know yeah. i remember back in the day when my kids were little were i was listening to i, I know i listened to a, a christian radio station but some other one was talking about net those types of touch meaning something positive like it, it was supposed to happen no it's the the fact is that it's happening and people aren't dealing with the fact that it's happening you yeah. know i knew some things when i was young that my parents didn't know until i was older and told them what i knew yeah you know and that's why i was a great educator because i was like hey no you cannot go in the basement no because i remembered what happened in the basement or i remember what happened to my friends at their situation in their situations you know i remember the pains of life and i take everything that god has allowed me to endure and 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 live through mm -hmm. i bring that stuff with me so that when i'm counseling these families while i'm providing these services i'm able to understand exactly where they're coming from instead of looking at them like oh my god you let this happen or happen or that happen to you i'm not surprised by anything that happens in life because mm -hmm. i've already lived through things that i thought that would, i thought they would kill me and that's so, the thing, you know, and then there's some, I'm sorry, there's some counselors. Uh, I also want to know what, uh, what the doctor had to say about people when they're trying to get counseling. Like in my situation, I had some people tell me they wouldn't counsel my surviving child because my case was high profile. So my child, okay, they're in law school now and, and we could be doing better, but the traumas of life have impacted us and the way that they have. And, but even though that we look good on paper, still just thinking about the fact that my baby could do better, maybe if they had a better chance, if those counselors would have stepped in instead of saying, oh, your case is high profile. And we think we may be we may be brought into court. And if we come into court, then courts don't typically pay us. So now you just on your own. What do you have to say about that? Um, I have a lot to say about that. I think, number one, anytime Brad fits on the psychological side or the medicine side, uh, high quality of care is absolutely necessary, and we should never lower the standards of that. And I think that uh, when it may be challenging because of a political arena or some media arena that we drop the ball and we lack the support, then we're being negligent as clinicians and practitioners. We don't care about that stuff. I don't give a dog on you Republican, you Democrat, or you a Biden supporter or a Trump supporter. That's not going to stop me from being the doctor. We take an oath. Uh, mm -hmm. to make sure that we are giving the highest level uh, of quality of care. So I'm sorry that that happened. Secondly, you're exactly right. Uh, the outcomes most definitely can be better when we can catch young people earlier as possible. Uh, Frederick Douglass said it's far easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And mm -hmm. so I'm really, I'm re I really hold that as a core value. The quicker that we can catch young people during brain development and all of that, the better we can start re also rewiring. So we re-rewire the brain. So we know mm -hmm. trauma can rewire the brain, but the right treatment and the right uh, support and the right relationship, we can rewire the brain for healing as well. And I think that we don't really talk about that uh, enough. Um, and Sandra, you made a great point I didn't get to elaborate is, uh, you know, when it comes to faith and it comes to the church realm, um, sometimes we just think, you know, we're just going to preach it away, shout it away and pray it away. Um, and we still got to deal with the science and God gave us the science and everything is not a demon. Some things can be and everything is not. Um, some things is just disorders and dysfunctions that's going on in the brain and in the body that we have to address. Now, my thing, I like the holistic approach. 
to where you need to see your doctor for the body, see your therapist for the mind, and see your pastor for the soul. Because the way that our bodies are created is mind, body, and soul. So if you have support and getting services from the spiritual side, from the mental side, from the physical side, it increases your outcome. So like me, um, I like to partner with other, so because sometimes pastors do counseling, right? So I like to partner with uh, the the um, the pastor. I like to partner with the therapist and because I can do things that they can't do. I can look at labs, right? I can look at I can look at your cortisol levels just through your labs alone and be like, oh yeah, that trauma is real by just looking at how your panels read. Uh, so yeah, it's a holistic approach and by which I think that we should look at how do we push the narrative on uh, on on wellness. Mm-hmm. And I've actually had pastors invite me to come in and speak on on their Sunday services and made a Sunday uh, mental health Sunday. Uh, service where it really blessed the whole congregation. And I always have many people come to me like, oh my God, like you hit so many points. Um, So yeah, so I just think that we have to do better on promoting wellness and also saying it's okay not to be okay. Um, We don't have to fake the funk. We don't have to fake it till we make it. There are just some times, it's just some bad days. Yes, we're going to have some victorious days, but just on events, based on our triggers, what triggers, certainly we can have emotional downward spirals. And it, Tuesday is just not a good day, you know, and it's OK to let, let Tuesday not be a good day. Mm-hmm. Set boundaries, set some, uh, do some self-care, doing the things that you need to do so that you can promote your own healing. Yeah. You know, here's another thing I was, you know, when I was living in St. Louis, I was like, man, you know, we covered so many devastating crimes and it's so You know, the kids are immersed in seeing crime every single day. And I always wonder when you're in such an environment like that and some people feel like they just can't escape it and the cycle continues. And I know know Theta can probably speak to that as well. But I'm wondering, like, what what can we do? You know, when you do see things, I know we've tried, you know, like Theta says, she talks to kids. She understands, you know, when she sees and sees the signs and things like that. But I'm wondering just in general. What can people just do in general? Is there a way for, for people to help who may not be all the way in it, but they see it? You know what I'm saying? Like, what can you do? Yeah. Um, so there are some, some most, you know, uh, Bruce Perry, a, a big psychiatrist that in the field of trauma, like I am, says um, that the, the, the greatest therapy um, is human love. And, and I think it all starts out with love. Um, believe it or not, love creates safety. When a person feels real genuine love, it shifts the brain from being hyper aroused in that fight or flight on guard, ready to snap, ready to post up, ready to put hands on people, right? That's that fight or flight, that freeze (laughs) response, right? And I think a lot of times we don't talk about that, that Uh, That trauma response is not a one hit wonder. What happens when your brain is stuck on high alert? What happens if you're always living in a hood? You you know, you're living in poverty or, you know, you constantly seeing violence where our brain gets stuck. That's also with kids, too. So when kids come to school, um, there's a what I what I say in my work is a hijacking of the frontal lobe in the prefrontal context. So it doesn't matter how great the teacher is teaching mathematics and teaching algebra. If I'm in flight or flight and I'm wondering where I'm going to stay and lay my head when the last bell rings, I'm not paying attention to pedagogy. I'm not paying attention to curriculum. So so I think that we need to be understanding uh, what trauma does to us and how it keeps us stuck. Um, And then I haven't even went into other avenues where we know I I got a slide on one of my trainings where it talks about trauma impacts the cognition, the physical of the emotional, the mental, and all of these different things. And that's important because if I'm going through trauma, I also have attachment issues, right? Because the dissociation is so real and every system has failed me. Uh, I don't trust as easy, right? So that that just don't happen. That just don't happen when I'm 9 and 13. That happens when I'm 31 and 42 and 55. So I come into these spaces trying to build relationships, build friendships, or even marriage, you know, and I had all this stuff I never dealt with when I was nine years old. Now this other person is is is, is paying for a debt that somebody else wrote the check. I always call it, if we don't heal from our traumas, we're going to bleed on people that didn't cut us. And so we see all that bleeding and hemorrhaging on all kind of people because we're never given a chance to just focus on our own cuts and wounds from the traumas that has happened to us. That's a really I think, good um, 
Go ahead. Adina. I'm sorry. One thing that I um, did when I worked at for the public school system here in St. Louis was I was able as a family and community specialist, I was able to bring in different organizations or different agencies, counseling agencies. Um, I know like the WOW program or um, BH or Pass Out literature just to make the families aware of the services that are out there are a lot of services that are free you know so just you know there there were some great things happening in the St. Louis public school system even though um and I feel like we were doing the big work because we didn't have all the monies that a lot of these private institutions had but we you know were at least I definitely was tapping into those resources because I wanted to provide what was best for my families. And then when you have a great PTO at your school, you know, it, usually if you find a school with a great PTO, you're going to have a school with better grades and better pretty much everything because those parents are involved in their child's care. But unfortunately, because we were a public school and we were free, free, a lot of people weren't able to tap into a lot of those services because they had the whole two or three jobs, which was causing more trauma, you know, and just being able to look at things differently as an educator. So, uh, you know, like I didn't think that just because a parent didn't show up at school to pick up a report card that they didn't want to be there. No, I know my parents and I know they have more than one job, you know, but still that parent has to deal with the fact that they can't be there when they want to be there. So I think that's another reason why it is good for us to seek out help, not just from our friends and family, but sometimes from some pro professionals. But unfortunately, all the people that are professional aren't professional. You know, I, I appreciate everything that Mr. Holt is speaking about. And I wish we had a plethora of you. But the truth <laughs> is that at least here in St. Louis. Yeah, I would just <laughs> I mean, you decided to come over here. I was just out there. I did. Uh, I was the keynote on uh, for trauma resilience at uh, Riverview Garden Schools. Um, oh, that was a great place yeah, to be. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I was. Yeah, they had me come out in. Um, I believe it was in August. Um, I did awesome. a big keynote on trauma resilience because I talk about trauma informed is not enough. We just talk about the same problems. We got to create building blocks to shift from trauma informed to trauma resilience. And I think that that's what we miss too, that there's power and resilience that we don't talk enough. Um, it doesn't mean that the trauma did not hurt us and the trauma still doesn't impact us, but we're not allowing it to, to rob us of our future and to keep us down. Um, mm -hmm. And so that's why I talk about that resiliency because we don't get to that trauma resilience. So I created a, a training model for schools, for foster care agencies um, called the uh, TRS, Trauma Resilience Schools, where I start teaching about how do we move from just talking about what has happened and what's been done to actually creating that healing journey. And it's certainly a journey and mm -hmm. it looks different for everybody. It's case by case, you know, and the, the time frame, the duration of what that looks like. But I think in these spaces, we do have to talk more about uh, the power of resilience that is in all of us and how we can rebound and how we can be still be successful and still impact others who have had their traumas as well. It's a village and we come together as a village to create a space of healing. And I think we need to talk more on that resilience and healing piece because uh, most definitely being a person of faith, I do know there's healing in God. I do believe that uh, you know, we we like the Timex watch. We can take some liquids and keep on ticking. We can keep moving <laughs> forward, right? So I'm telling your uh, age, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. our ages. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Dr. Holt, you were talking about you know um, the whole issue of of healing in the community and all of that. So how do you feel that people can really embrace that and, and help get things going to make things better for their communities? Uh, I think that we have to wrap our heads around healing is dope. Uh, we are our best versions uh, when we are healed um, and we're starting a healing version. A man that is working on his early childhood trauma is less than a, less angry and explosive and can use his words to communicate better. 
Uh, he's more regulated when he's starting his healing journey. Uh, a sister that um, that recognizes her trauma, what has happened, uh, she don't have to bleed all over the place with her emotions. She can use her words to say exactly how she's feeling and articulate what that looks like and also have self-value about herself um, and not walk around with low self-esteem and less value because and looking at yourself as damaged goods, all of the negative stuff uh, that, that we articulate. Uh, I mean, it can, go, it can go from all kind of different spaces when it comes to that healing journey. Church has got to realize that you don't know everything and you don't have all of the answers and you can learn too and we can start looking at even in churches how do we even do uh, i don't expect them to do clinician practitioner type of work but you know what does tier one uh, mental health support services look like in youth ministries and young adult ministries at church where a lot of people that just come into the church have all of these early childhood traumas, having brave conversations. Um, yeah, it may, it may be tough. It may be rough to have these discussions, but you can't conquer something that you're not willing to confront. So you first got to be able to confront it and talk about the bad and the ugly way before you can get to the good part. Um, we got to remove the stigma. We got to quit making people uh, feel some kind of way because they are getting help. Sometimes it's not just verbals. I, they, some, I don't think people understand you, you, you express non-verbals when people say they see a doctor. They just stare at you like you're crazy. You they get that. Say, but they actually just look at you like what? So, or are you know, um, yeah. that stuff too? That part right there. Like, um, uh, so, okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So it all looks different and getting help may be one-on-one Getting help, maybe group therapy, getting help, maybe even family therapy. So I think that let's not be one dimensional. Sometimes the whole family got to come together and talk about issues. And then sometimes it's couples, sometimes it's groups, sometimes it's individual. But we just all got to come to a place where mm -hmm. uh, it's okay to not be okay. You mm -hmm. identify uh, what, what those needs are. And then you, you, and then, and let me say this. Getting a doctor is not is not equivalent to all people. What I, what I mean is that you need to be a little bit, you need to vet your doctor. You need to make sure that your doctor, your traumas, uh, your uh, your therapist is trauma-informed. They understand, because there's a lot of clinicians that are still not trauma-informed. They just want you to sit in a chair, talk about your depression, and then invoice your insurance. That is not what you're looking for, right? You need somebody who's who's relevant to you uh it may be uh you may you're a female you've been through a lot you don't even though he's a male doctor you don't feel comfortable talking to a male therapist you probably want a female that that connects with you more vice versa it could be male um it's the same way i know some females i mean my wife is the same i will but not see a male uh obgyn <laughs> she's like uh-uh they ain't happening um because <laughs> of her expenses and i get it like gee because you, you, you gotta feel safe you gotta feel like people understand you they get you they gotta you gotta feel like you're seen um and affirmed uh so yeah so when we're talking about these this place of getting healing i'm just trying to throw out as many things in the time we had that is very, very necessary. You know, you might not need a therapist that's from the Hamptons and from Hollywood and from Beverly Hills and, and mm. just got theory and God did their dissertation on research, but have no lived experience. And here you are in the hood, been through hell and high water, and they're totally dis, dis, disconnected, right? So those are the things I think we don't talk enough about is we say, yeah, go get help. But it's not just a simple. You got to get the right help. You need to have the right therapist. And sometimes it may be, I need a therapist of color. I need somebody that understood, mm -hmm. you know, what it's like, you know, living in these spaces and things of that nature. So when we say get help and bring healing, I just wanted to just articulate and throw a lot of extra sauce on that, that I think a lot of times we don't articulate enough. And so this is where people say, well, I went to the therapy, that don't work. No, it doesn't mean the therapy didn't work. You might didn't have the right practitioner. You might not have the right clinician that really one specializing your issue have some enough lived experience to be able to connect with you so those are some extra things we need to know because i think you also added why people say well i ain't get there because it don't work sometimes people actually try but it wasn't the right mm -hmm. practice
practitioner and clinician. So we really need to have this harmonious relationship between patient and practitioner as well. Mm -hmm. And I think people need to also understand that when they have their own trauma and that, like I said, I'm not a parent yet, but I, I, mm -hmm. I've seen it where what happens to them trickles down. And I don't think people really realize how much of an impact their trauma, their energy has on their generation, you know, their kids and their circle, really their circle, because sometimes people, when they have their trauma, it, they kind of drain, you know, drain on you too, because they're not dealing with it, but you're, you're absorbing all of that from them. And it's just really hard to, you know what I mean? To, to manage that too. Yeah, most definitely. I think that that's what goes into my other book, Hurting People Hurt People Stop Bleeding on People That Didn't Cut You. So that's another book. He has a great resource. Um, Is that on Audible? It's not yet. I'm talking to people okay. to get that on Audible. Right now it is a uh, hard copy and ebook right now. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, and, yeah, I mean, you got to deal with your cuts in your wounds because you're going to bleed on people that didn't cut you. Parents do it to kids. Husbands do it to wives. Wives do it to husbands. Teachers do it to their students. Mm -hmm. Police officers do it to their neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. If we do not That's deal right. with our cuts and wounds, we would just blah. We just we just spill on everybody and it's not fair. And that impacts our closest relationships that impacts our marriages. You know, I always said, you know, I know we do pre-counseling, but as a trauma doctor, I always said, man, we did a trauma assessment before people got married. Lord have mercy. I just up with the counsel bar. You need a trauma assessment. We need to know yeah. what you walking in day one, your first 100 days, uh, because people are battling with some real demons and disorders that that you have no clue. Exactly. Yeah. So then they'll be ready to sue you for bringing out the truth. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 so, yeah. so Theta, Theta, let me ask you this question. You know, and and I know that that you've been able to kind of heal yourself, right? You know, your situation by helping other people. Um. So, so how how are you transitioning with that now? Are you still kind of moving forward and growing? Uh, your organization and what you guys are doing for people in the public, because I know you're kind of you're kind of like a face of of the community now with with certain issues. So how is that going? Um, it's going. I'm thinking about um trying to let certain things go and go more in a personal um moving into a. I mean, I, I I do this because I'm a personal advocate, but I'm not getting as much um support or the supports that I need through the organization and and actually my support the things that I've done through the organization, they've pretty much moved me to just want to just go all in on a personal level because there are things that I like to do since I love the law and I love breaking down the law and I love debating and I love expressing myself. There's some things that I can't do under the umbrella or under as a, as a nonprofit leader because I have to be nonpartisan. There's some things that I can't do to get those 501c3 dollars that I can, that if I did it in my personal capacity, I can do. So it's sometimes people can't, I, I guess, you know, like some people will come to me and ask me to do certain things. And I'm saying I can't do that under looking for an angel, mm -hmm. but I can do that on my personal time. And so I've been doing, going back and forth, but actually I feel like I would have a stronger impact if I just kind of let the one side go create um, legislation like I've been doing in my personal capacity to make the system do what it was, what it should be doing anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's like all of the, I'm up here trying to get all these dollars, get people to volunteer, get people to do all this stuff when we have a system that's already designed to, they say that they're doing this stuff. But my thing is you're not, so I'm going to make you do it. Okay. So I we that. have that, I mean, that's, that's just, I mean, and it's not, and I feel like we all have the power within us to do it once we know how the system works. Mm -hmm. So while I'm, it's, it's just like, if I could go straight to Jefferson City and get someone to create legislation to, to add a picture instead of a silhouette yes. on a Miss a Person flyer, first of all, who even came up with the idea that it's okay to put a silhouette? out here to represent a person that's missing when there's almost 1,400 people missing from the state of Missouri right now. Mm 
-hmm. So we, instead of going to Cardinal games, we should be maybe looking for these people that are missing. And how come we're not um, pulling together um, people from different municipalities? That's one of the complaints about St. Louis. We have so many municipalities. You roll from one into the other and you can get tickets all down the block. But my thing is, why aren't we just collaboratively just pulling people from those different municipalities and having those people go out to look for our people? Mm -hmm. Now, I can't do that through looking for an angel. I mean, I could probably say, okay, this is a great idea. But if I can get a legislator to make it real, mm -hmm. to put it on paper and hold people accountable for not doing it, to me, that's where the power is. So, yeah. you know, the, the more I do this work, the more I just want to make it easier. Mm -hmm. I want to make, I want to work smarter. And I want to hold these uh, officials that we're putting in positions of power accountable because they do what we want. They can do what we want them to do, but they're doing what they want to do. And a lot of them are too comfortable mm -hmm. and we're not calling them out and making them do the jobs that we put them there to do. So instead of us getting mad at each other, we ought to get mad at those people that we're putting, putting in positions of power, you know, who are allowing these things to happen. And even the leadership in the church, I'm just saying a lot of times they want to pray things away. How many pastors really weren't there for me? Mm -hmm. You know, or they wanted me to create a minister, a ministry in their church, which was <laughs> our church. But now you're giving me, I'm already traumatized. Now I got to run the organization and do this for your church. Yeah. Really? Yeah. I could mm -hmm. probably stay alive by myself. You're not even going out looking for my baby. Mm -hmm. Really? And you know, but what, what about before my child went missing and all I wanted was somebody to see my baby when, when Christian was in a coma. I had a pastor that refused to go and see my child in the hospital. Wow. And I oh, never wow. even said anything to them because I was like, well, you know, other people have first. I mean, my thing is, look, okay, if you're afraid to do a sin, one of your pastoral friends. Mm. So my thing is, even if, I mean, I understand we're all people, we all have our fears, we all can do so much, but at least explain to me why you're not doing the things that I expect you to do. And maybe my expectations are too high and this church is not for me, but I've been through a plethora of churches and a lot of them have, oh, uh, well, at least one of them showed me the door. A lot of them, they were, they, this one, well, he was friends okay. with his dad. <laughs> that's how, that's how, when he when a pastor looking at you directly and says the doors of the church are open and you like wait a minute you talking to me yeah they talk to you i'm just saying people know that i'm gonna say it like it is that's one thing about me i don't care what capacity i find myself in mm. i may say it gently but i'm gonna say it if it needs to be said and if they don't want me there then it's time to move on and, actually, and that's how courageous my battle has made me now. It's like, I'm not, at first I was like, oh, if I say this, the police going to get mad and then they're not going to look for my son. Well, they ain't going to look anyway. They're not looking anyway. Mm. So what are we going to do to make them look? And we you can know, use the military force. They're not even using the military. Okay, we can send them to another country to fight a war, but we can't fight this missing person battle right here in America? Really? And in actually, St. Louis? And the, the, and actually, that's what's leading me to the another question that I have because when we're talking about missing persons cases, and I, I know you mentioned ambiguous loss earlier because I think that's something that I really want to kind of get into a little bit. We have yes. we have probably about twenty some thirty minutes left. I think we can talk. Um, so when it comes to ambiguous loss, uh, Doctor Halt, that seems like such a a difficult thing to really grab grab a hold of because there's so many unanswered questions. How do people you know, really manage or deal with that. And I said, that's something that Theta can maybe, you know, take take some insight off of as well. Yeah, so I think that she said some some heartbreaking things. Um, I mean, like when you can't go to any institution for love and support, you exactly. know you should be able to go to the house of God. Exactly. Um, to be a person of faith and have that spiritual institution uh, let you down, that's that's traumatizing in itself because that goes against your moral compass um, in regards to supporting people who really need that support. And it sounds like certain pastors was like, I need your issue to to benefit my church. And if you know, if I don't if you can't do that, 
then I don't see no point why I would go see your child. I mean, it doesn't benefit. And that's heartbreaking. That's a, that, that's a moral composition because it's against the principles of Christ, right? So this is like when people are in the hospital, he said, go visit them. People in prison, go visit them. And he said, and when you have done it to them, you have done it unto me, right? Exactly. So, so that piece is very alarming because when other institutions have failed, especially people of color, even when we talk about civil rights, guess what was the institution that fought for our, our issues? And it was the black church. It was yes, and, and Dr. King and others created the black church as a hub to fight mm -hmm. for justice and, and, and discriminatory uh, issues that we experience and racism and experience. So when the black church is not, Mm. welcoming uh, to another black member of the community yeah that that's a that's a letdown then let's it's talk about problem. grief yeah then we talk about grief grief you know have five different stages from you know you go through depression then you shift from being pissed off and angry right and then you go into try to be accepting about it so you go through these different phases when we talk about grief um, grief is when anytime there's a major loss or there's a major change in our life, uh, it opens the door for grief. And usually death is both. It's certainly a major change because now that family member is not part of the family. They're dead and gone. And then two, um, it just it just from a, a mental and emotional, it just devastates you. Um, some, sometimes it's hard with grief because some people don't know how to support people in grief. You get some people to talk too much and they have all the answers. And sometimes you're just like, man, will you just shut up? Number two, I get tired of a thousand people asking me, how you doing? What do you think I'm feeling right now? Are you kidding me? Right? So I think even sometimes when we talk about grief, that members of our family, members of our community can really get on our last nerves uh, because they're not sensitive um, to what we're going through. Sometimes you just need a person just to be a space, right? Like, I don't need you to say a whole lot. I just need you to be available. Um, and, and that's very, very important when it comes to grieving. Next thing I would say, it is important to grieve. We have a lot of people that go through their circumstances and they refuse to grieve. And so that goes back to that bleeding on people that didn't cut us, is that when we don't allow ourselves to grieve, um, it's detrimental to our wellness, it's detrimental to our health, our mental, emotional, and our physical. You lose weight, you're not eating, uh, you're stressed out, depending on your stress. If you start getting under your 40s and, and your 50s, um, stress can turn into shingles. So we also got outbreaks that really can be painful that I know people that at a certain age, um, because of their stress level, it really debilitates their 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 health and wellness. So, um, yeah, so grief is something that is necessary that when you have a major change, it is healthy to grieve. Now, uh, nobody can tell somebody how long they should grieve. I think that is a big issue, right? Is they're like, well, uh, it's been six months. Like, why is you still looking like that? <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, people can really say some insensitive things. Um, and grief just looks different from every person. It may take one person. They may be able to get through it in eight months. It may take two years for others. It may take five. But allow people to grieve so that they can become the best version of themselves, and they can start connecting with new relationships. It's hard to do that when you're still in that deep dive of a grieving uh, season, and it's okay. And again, I always say, I like to affirm people who are hurting and say, it's okay to be, not to be okay. It's okay to say, you know what? I, I, if you're really my friend, I don't need you judging me. And I just need you to just ride this out with me for these next couple of weeks because I'm just triggered. Another thing I want to say about grief is the anniversary of a case or the anniversary of death, right? A lot of times we don't talk enough about when that anniversary date is coming, how it is start pulling on your soul and pull on your spirit. So you really also need good friends, families, and doctors uh, putting a wrap around service of support when that anniversary start coming because you start feeling triggered. You start feeling those emotions again. So uh, I can go all kind of way. I don't take too much time, but I just want to make sure I'm addressing a lot of issues. 
I really appreciate you bringing up that last point there, especially since my son's been missing since June 11, 2003. So like every year, people would look forward to me doing something. I'm tired of letting loose balloons and killing the animals. Yeah. I'm just saying yeah. I'm a human. Yeah. I like saving the environment. I'm not I'm not saying anything bad about people who want to do that, because if that's what you have to do, do what you have to do. But I personally, I would prefer the flowers, maybe because they'll go back to nature, you know. But so I just think like that. But uh, I appreciate the sentiment. I appreciate those people who are remembering my child and want me to do those things because yeah. just the idea that they want to do that is enough for me. You know, I'm like one of those people, the intrinsic things, and it doesn't have to be extrinsic, you know, yeah. with me. It's, if I know that you love me, that's that means more to me than anything. You know, just that you call me to say I'm thinking about you. That's everything to me. But a lot of times I think people find themselves half feeling like they have to go to that same location. And they have like as, at one point, I feel like I did to show the world I'm not I'm not done with this yeah. and I'm going to get justice. And I did. But yeah. everybody's not able to do that. So I don't want people with missing loved ones or murdered loved ones to feel like they always have to go out and tie a teddy bear around a tree. If you don't feel like doing that, don't do it. You know, because yeah. sometimes that's opening. You can't heal and go forward because you still have to wrap this teddy bear around a tree. Okay. And then every day you pass in that same tree and the rain, snow, sleet, and the, tr the every. I'm just saying, I've seen, a, I, there was this one poster that was in St. John. And every time I went down by the highway, I would see it. I saw it fade away where you couldn't even really see the ink on the flower anymore. And I always look, I still look even though it's not there because it's a memory. But I just want people to understand that we are in charge of our thoughts. You know, as a man thinketh, you know, I have to remember like Yolanda Adams put that on sometimes or just say it in my head that be anxious yeah. for nothing, but in all things through prayer and petition. I still have to do certain things just to get my mind right. That's why I say I have to eat right. I have to sleep right. I have to think yeah. right. I have to exercise. I have to do those things that I just know I need to do. Take my vitamins to make sure I'm regulated. You mm -hmm. know, and you know, stay away from certain crowds. Stay away from certain subjects. At one point in time when this was new, I couldn't watch action movies because I was yeah. ready to go and do some action. You yeah. know, and that's just the real. I, w I did a prison ministry with another organization years ago to help them to understand that could have been me where you are. You know, because I, like I said, I'm a thinker, so I could think about what I could do. And if I would have got caught in doing what I thought about doing, I would have been them. So like, I it's only by the grace of God that some of us are not where we could be. Well, you know what? So it's all about choices. I'm sorry. Oh, that's, that's okay. No, I mean, I love listening to everything you have to say. Um, I just want to ask uh, Dr. Hall, because I know you, you, you're you a pastor as well in combination with like being a doctor and everything like that. Yeah. So what do you say to people when they ask you, how do I grieve? Because I think mm -hmm. people don't understand how does that happen? How does it work? What do you do? How do you resolve? How do you know you're grieving? You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like truly. You know, like, like, in my instance, my brother's been gone. We left, we lost him to melanoma, you know, back in 2012. You know, he was 34, about mm -hmm. to get married, his whole mm -hmm. life ahead of him. And his cancer took him out just like that, right? So mm -hmm. for us, it was very shocking education about melanoma, aside from that. But also just the grieving process, it was so, because we were so close. You know, mm -hmm. you expect the older people to go before you, right? So that's kind of mm -hmm. something you, you're kind of ready for, you've seen uh, it and all that. But when yeah. it's a sibling and, it, and it's someone close to you or like, like the, her son, all that, it's just like, how do you know that process? You know what I'm saying? And yeah, how do you know when you're done? Or are you ever done? Um, well, I, I, in, in, in levels of grief, I just think that there's different stages. Um, I will say that no matter how long uh, time goes, you're never fully going to just not feel. That's not what grieving is. And I think that some people think that, well, I'm a grief, it's going to be over. No, that's not even being realistic. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to always, that birthday, that whatever you did as a ritual for Christmas, what did you guys do for Thanksgiving and 4th of July? Um, those things will bring a level of emotions. And so one of the things in cognitive therapy is always, we always say that you're, what feeds your mood 
is what you've been thinking about for for a good mm -hmm. size amount of time. If you keep thinking about a certain thing, it impacts your mood for the positive or the negative. And so another thing I want to throw out is when we talk about grieving, how do I know? Is I know how I know how a person is grieving by looking at what they're not doing. When they go into a cave and they shut everybody out, or when they are uh showing a lot of avoidance um and, and not wanting to feel powerless, they they go into this cave and they put themselves in this cocoon, which opens the door for depression. Because believe it or not, mm -hmm. everybody needs somebody. Every mm -hmm. single person. If Jesus needed 12, told, trust me, mm -hmm. everybody needs somebody. Um, and you have to allow yourself to feel, and, and that hurts. It hurts like hell, right? Um, but you can't avoid it. And so what people do is they dissociate and they detach. Mm -hmm. And what happens is when they dissociate and detach, they put themselves on this island all by themselves, and they don't face their feelings and their emotions. And exactly. it's tough. I mean, I, I'm not going to lie to you. It, it is not easy to deal with those kind of emotions. And it is easier sometimes to show avoidance. But you've got to drive through it. You have to embrace it. You have to allow yourself to feel now, this is where I said we don't talk about trauma resilience enough, is that there is strength in the midst of pain. Um, there, there is perseverance in the midst of trials. Um, and that's where we can also, if negative, in, if negative images in my mind can get me depressed, certainly positive experiences with my loved one that's no longer with me can ignite a, a level of joy as well. And so as he just quoted, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. I am the product of my thoughts. So if I start using more positive experiences that I've had with my child or I have with my brother that put smiles on my face, that ain't, that gives you, that puts you in a brighter and a better mood. Um, and then again, Grief looks different from every person. Some people need 12 months. Some somebody else need 48. Um, but whatever that is, it's okay to be okay. And then loved ones, church folks, the church folk talks about it. they want to quote scripture, be deep. You know, I don't need that right now. <laughs> just let me cry. You know what I'm saying? I don't need I don't, just let me cry. Let me exactly. Jesus cry. Man, come exactly. on. So exactly. Jesus showed emotion. So if the Son of God um could do it, then certainly who am I? So I just think we need to just be realistic. Don't set high expectations. That's not realistic because that if anything to make you depressed, it's setting goals too high that you can't attain. Just just be just go through and then it's day by day um as a journey. And there's all kinds of things you can do. You can see a therapist. You can see a doctor. You might need prescription. I'm not a big fan of just throwing. I don't like doctors just throwing a prescription on everybody. But if you get so psychotic, if your depression shifts from mild, from moderate to manic, what we might need is to actually put you on prescription to get you regulated um, so that somebody can talk to you, right? If you're out of it, you can get so manic that no matter what anybody say, it's not effective. So sometimes we might have to put you on some type of antidepressant, any anxiety, some type of psychotropic type of medicine to get you into a space of calm so that now the practitioner, the doctor, the pastor, whoever that is, can now speak into mm -hmm. your space. But if your frontal lobe is hijacked, if you, yeah, so all of that stuff matters when we start talking about that healing journey. Yes, you do need to eat better. You do need to go to the gym and work your body out. All of that plays a part on your moods as well. You do need to watch your diet. There's some there's some restrictions on your nutrition that certain people with psychotic issues should not even be putting exactly. in their body. I can exactly. tell you that right now. And when they do, and on top of that, they're low on vitamin D3. Most Arizonians here, because it's so hot with the sun, we don't even get enough of our vitamin D. So we see that in the science that low vitamin D means dysregulation in moods, right? 
uh, impact your serotonin levels. Your diet, we eating all this red dye, all this sugar, all of these processed foods, and all these omega-6 and not enough omega-3s. We see it in the science. Um, um, you're you're gonna have more dysregulation, vitamin D deficiencies. So yeah, so so many different spaces too. And we're talking about social, emotional. It's not just about therapy sitting in somebody's chair. Yes. From a doctor's perspective, I'm looking at the whole picture, looking at your diet, looking at your um your microbiome. A lot of people don't know in your microbiome, which is your digestional tract. If you got imbalances mm -hmm. with a lot of bad bacteria. Versus good bacteria, that flora that should be more positive, that impacts mm -hmm. your serotonin levels too. So it's way bigger than just sitting in somebody's chair talking about depression. If you come to Dr. Ho, I'm doing your labs. I'm going to look at your panels. I'm going to be looking at everything and say, I, all these dots got the click for you to really be regulated mentally and emotionally. So this is what I call holistic education the right here the whole <laughs> thing no, I'm like, the whole I, maybe thing. i need to can i just fly in to see you <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hunt, i think she's just trying to get an appointment to see what's going on <laughs> oh, and i want the book too yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so we're gonna get to the book system. Yeah, so we'll talk about the books in just a second i just want to ask something yeah. real quickly we have about seven minutes left um okay just, just really quickly, uh, Dr. Hull, and maybe Athita, you can chime in on this as well. The impact yeah. of COVID, I'm kind of switching up a little bit, hmm. but the impact on COVID on our society and what's happened, what have you seen, uh, Dr. Holt, with that as far as a change and in, in how things are with people, with all the loss and, and, the, and the mental health, and there's so many things that have happened. Um, what have you seen? What did you see? And what are you seeing? Um, yeah, that's a really good question, and uh, that's a, that that we've seen a lot. Uh, we've seen uh, mental health skyrocket three times higher than ever. So a lot of uh, doctors were worn out, uh, ER doctors, a lot of colleagues, clinicians. Uh, one of the things that we saw is the doctors that you went to to help you, we were burned out. We, I mean. Mm -hmm. Uh, the numbers of patients and, and clients had skyrocketed. We just couldn't take no more. Uh, I remember my wife, was, you know, I, I travel. So I travel to school districts all over the nation supporting them. Uh, excuse me. And my wife's like, no, you need to sit still for a minute. Like, you got to, you got to pour, you got to be your own self care. You got to do. Uh, what you're teaching the whole nation to do and what you're writing books about to do. And that was some of them, that was extremely wise to have a, a, a partner, um, a wife to, to really, you know, call me on the carpet and like, no, <laughs> you're not Jesus, right? So uh, you, you, you're going to have to do your own. Uh, so COVID skyrocketed also substance abuse. So we start seeing alcohol. We start seeing people doing meth. We start seeing op opioids, fentanyl, still, which is an issue today, uh, start mm -hmm. increasing as well because people just didn't know how to deal with the massive amount of grief. Uh, pastors uh, were suffering from extreme depression because they were burying their members left and right and there was nothing they could do. Um, pastors also struggled too because the fact that not only did they die, but the hospital prevented them from visiting. So they were dying and they couldn't even get to the hospital to even support them and pray for them. And so it was just so much going on when the school systems had closed. And uh, so kids began to dissociate in social distancing. So they wasn't learning. And, and then when we brought them back, mentally and emotionally, I did a survey on students. And a lot of them said they wasn't even prepared to even be back mentally and emotionally. And then they lost certain classmates and family members. So they were going through stuff. So yeah, we start talking about what did COVID do um, to us? It really traumatized the nation. And you still got to remember, uh, you know, not picking sides, not being political, but we had Trump in office that was doggone not really doing nothing about it. And that was traumatizing people. I mean, having questionable practitioners speaking into this space and not listening to, uh, man, what's that guy named? Dr. Uh, uh, Fauci. Fauci. Dr. Fauci. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it wasn't even listening to Dr. Fauci. I mean, put him on the sideline, took him off the air. 
to give us uh, some of the best practices on how to deal with COVID. I mean, so when you start talking about that stuff, it's so big. And now that um, I'm not going to say COVID is over because we still can catch COVID, just got different strands now. Um, but pretty much the post-COVID era has drastically been impacted from education. Mm -hmm. Academics is ridiculous right now. Kids' behavior is off the chain. They're dysregulated. We got teachers that lost people. Um, so they're trying to get into a classroom space to offer instruction, and they are emotionally imploding. Teachers' burnout now is in October of the school season, mm. and that's not even second semester. I mean, so wherever you want to go with this, Chandra, I can tell you, COVID has really impacted the country. All right. So it looks like we've got about two minutes left. So I just want to make sure I get the details about like the books and all that stuff, what you guys are doing so we can wrap that up really quickly. Mm -hmm. Dr. Holt, tell me about the books and where can people find you, Dr. Holt? All right. So number one, um, the book that's really, you know, selling right now is uh, Trauma, the New Public Health Emergency and Education. If you're an educator, social worker, counselor, principal, school superintendent, you most definitely want that book. You want this book uh, going forth and then two. I got I got I got about ten, so I'm only gonna do two. So okay. hurting people, hurting people, <laughs> hurting people, hurt people. Um, stop believing on people is another book on Amazon that you most definitely want to get. And I'll say thirdly, I, I just published my doc, uh, my uh, doctoral dissertation, um, and uh, the name of it is called "My Body's on Fire: Inflammation, the Silent Killer." If you want to really learn where a lot of the root causes of why Americans are not getting better is because of chronic and cellular inflammation, so go get those books uh, and um, read them. Spread the word of healing and i just want you to know no matter what has happened to you in your past trauma may be your history but it does not have to rob you of your destiny so let's go let's help all people right. heal right on one minute theater all right before i wrap this i got one minute <laughs> okay well i've been throwing myself more so into the arts and like i said kind of transitioning into more of that uh, impact politically in the okay. community or more of an impact but um uh, my art name is Theta Rocks. Theta Roxanne is my birth name, Theta Roxanne Wilson. So if you look up Theta Rocks, that's me. Thank you both. Conversation was phenomenal. And I'll be putting the podcast out. I'll be putting, Thank adding information like toward, you know, beginning and ends of it so people can catch on all the stuff that you guys are talking about. But again, mm -hmm. Dr. Holt. Thank you so much, Dr. Damon Holt, Theta Person, Theta Wilson. I'm not know which name I'm going to go with. I'm just going to leave it there. Wilson. <laughs> it's going to be Theta Wilson for life. Okay, got you. When it comes to my final thoughts about this episode, I can say it's one of the deepest conversations that I've had on my podcast. Through all of my years of doing this podcast on missing persons and murder cases, I always knew there was a lot of trauma mixed in and involved with it. And now I have more insight into how people can handle that. And I hope you learn something along the way. As for future endeavors, it looks like Dr. Holtz will continue his work to serve his church and his community. And remember, he said he had like 10 books out there and he only mentioned a couple, but you can find them all on Amazon. You can just search his name. And another thing is I will add that link to the description box in this episode. As for Theta, I know she's also working on moving forward in her work as an advocate by fighting for funding and legislation that can help people with missing loved ones. And I know for sure that she won't stop. This was a fulfilling and thoughtful conversation, and I'm looking forward to sharing this with as many people as possible. If you have a story or an issue that you want me to check out, just go to my Intrigued Full Effect website or my Facebook page and message me there or send me an email at intriguedfulleffect at hotmail.com. Until next time, be safe and stay true. The views, information, or opinions expressed during the Intrigued Full Effect, Curious Cases, Disappearances, and Other Stuff podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the host. The primary purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. The host of this podcast assumes no liability or responsibility for any activities in connection with opinions shared in the podcast. The podcast and blog associated with it shall not be used in any legal capacity or as a basis for expert testimony. 
Any copyright material in the podcast is approved by the owner or is part of the public domain. Music by Pond5.